Morning all. Let's have a look at another great game from Natalia Pogonina in the Russian Women's Super Finals, just played recently. So this was actually played on the 4th of August 2012. Natalia playing black. E4 was played by Kots by Kots in Seva. Should we call just just call her Tatiana from now on? Tatiana playing white against Natalia playing black. So we see actually the Royal of Hez Archbishop b5, a6, and actually we see now black wanting to play into the archangel variation, which is characterized by black later playing for bishop c5. For the moment, b5, and then bishop b7, which um, is not moving basically the bishop to e7. And you might think, is there a rush? Uh, to move this bishop, because what about this f7 pawn? If we have a quick look here, it's theoretically okay because say knight g5, trying to exploit black, not moving the bishop. d5 is possible here. He takes now knight d4, and black gets a good game. It seems pressure on the diagonal. For example, rook e1, and in this position. Bishop e7 may be a good move, even though black is going two pawns down. There's good compensation here. Black will be regaining uh, one of the pawns anyway soon and getting rid of white's light square bishop. Knight f3, say queen d6. Rook moves back. You can take the, the bishop now and then take on d5. And it's a great gambit position. It's only double pawns here. Black's got the bishop pair. This diagonal is very dangerous. So, in this variation, let's go back to the game. Uh, black is not moving that bishop yet to e7. Instead of b5 and, f and fin chattering the queen's bishop, white plays rook e1, which I believe is the main move. And now we see the characteristic bishop c5. So, eyeing the f2. Square. It looks quite dangerous actually for a bishop to be pointing straight at the king here, staring straight at the king. It's controlling d4, but it comes with some downsides. White wants to occupy the centre, and it's going to be with tempo now with c3 and d4. c3 is a logical move, it was played, and now we see d4. Okay, bishop b6. Black is not worried about losing this e5 pawn here. That's not a problem because we have this Fianchetto bishop on e4. So, say knight takes e5, we can take on e5 and then take on e4, and that would be quite good for black actually. Coordination. Okay, that's not doing too badly there. So, that's not a problem. In this position, after bishop b6, white just plays bishop e3. And you might think here, hold on a sec, isn't the e4 pawn on? Hasn't white just blocked the e4 pawn? It's trodden territory, but for those interested, let's have a quick look. Knight takes e4, d5 is apparently, it's, it looks like a strong move here. So say, say for example, knight e7, then taking is winning a piece because of that e4 knight. And say bishop takes e3, rook takes e3, and again, two pieces, two knights are being attacked. So there's a bit of a poison pawn there, just for those interested. So you can't take on e4 because of d5. So black plays in this position d6, reinforcing that e5 pawn. Knight bd2. H6. Actually, all these moves have occurred before. It goes quite deep, this variation of the Royal of Pairs, this Archangel variation, part of Morphe defense, I believe, according to chessgames.com. So, um, H3, and now rook e8. D5, which, okay, it looks as though this is quite dangerous. Uh, Why it's going to potentially double the pawns here? And isn't that going to be bad for black? Well, not really, it seems. After knight e7, 
Well, it does take a double of pawns, but there's quite a bit of dynamic play here. This C file, the weakening of the dark squares, making this maybe more effective. And um, is White really going to try and attack the queen side now and potentially undouble the pawns to try and get access to other weaknesses? Well, actually, White will still play for a4 and undouble the pawns, believe it or not, in this position. First, though, bishop c2, now knight g6. Now, pointing at the queen side structure with bishop d3 is still going to occur because often you do need to undouble the opponent's pawns to really get access to more exploitable weaknesses. For the moment, knight d7 looks as though this knight is coming to the nice c5 square and it could torture white's queen side with, say, knight a4. And combine that with rook c8, it's going to be uncomfortable pressure. Not only that, though, there's this possibility created of f5 at some point, which will try and liberate this bishop across the diagonal and weaken white's center pawns. Bishop f1 here, and we see rook c8. So rook c8 looks as though black's trying to intensify and lock down white's queen side. But um, white plays a4, so this undoubling of the pawns, which might seem paradoxical. But, um, okay, black takes on a4 and plays b5. After rook a3, now knight b6. So what has white gained from this? Well, there is more clear pressure on, on these two pawns. And maybe, you know, at some point, these weaknesses could, could be apparent, say a knight maneuver. But for the moment, black is pretty solid. G3 is played, and then we see rook f8. So the emphasis is now on this f5, potentially. Bishop d3, and now queen d7, hitting h3. King protects h3. And then we see knight e7. Knight is not really doing much there, but here it's supporting f5 and hitting d5 at the same time. Knight h4 would seem to be wanting to really discourage f5. You get that impression with these guys eyeing f5 that uh, f5 is going to be severely punished here. Knight a4 attacking b2, and that's protected with rook a2. But now we see a dynamic pawn sack made more effective because of the, the unfortunate rook position now. If this pawn is lost, it's with tempo. So actually f5 does seem more attractive now, and it is actually played, undermining white's center. And it looks as though maybe c4 has got some issues with it as well, or maybe just black will play f4, carry on, 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 on the king side. Let's have a look here, actually. In the game, knight takes f5 was played, which seems to be quite committal for, for losing that d5 pawn with this tempo gaining attack on the rook. But what could white do here? Let's have a quick look at the engine evaluation. It may already be that black's better. Black's actually doing very well in this position. A move like c4 is probably a blunder, actually. OK, so knight c5 or even bc4. It seems, you know, this, this shows, actually, that white center can crumble a bit, this variation. And knight, the knight coming back to c5, it's very, very cosy for black. Pressure on the f file, offside knight. That's to be avoided. In the game, okay, the test, the challenge was accepted. White took on f5, and allowed this tempo gaining bishop takes d5. Evaluation isn't so bad for white, but it looks as though black's doing very well. Slight advantage for black, which is a great achievement, really, to have with the black pieces. Visually, it looks as though... This bishop is, is a fine piece at the moment, eyeing the knight squares as well as hitting the rook. White plays c4, and instead of the bishop going backwards, we see knight c5 counterattacking white's bishop. Okay, white moves that bishop, and now this bishop goes back. And now, White tries to hold on to the f5 pawn.
by playing g4. A slight downside to this, this rook is actually naturally placed on the f file. This rook seems artificially placed. Uh, this bishop seems naturally placed on the diagonal. This bishop is ready to defend that diagonal. The knight's nice on c5, but can b4 kick the knight off its perch? Well, black's top priority, Natalia, thought it's good to secure the knight maybe on c5 here, but she played b4 before doing anything else. And this looks like a really creaky move that's played now, a quite passive move. And we've seen from a previous Natalia win, it doesn't really help White to play such a move. It creates all sorts of havoc and weaknesses, this sort of move that's played next. The ugly looking f3. Not only is it potentially weakening second ranks, as we've seen in the previous game, it's also weakening dark squares. This is the sort of move you really want to encourage your opponent to do. Um, in this position, what would be an engine suggestion, though, instead of that seemingly committal weakness creating move? Maybe knight b3, knight f3. f3 is actually given, though, uh, briefly. There is some logic to it, of course. There is a reason it's played. It's to reinforce e4 and mills play knight e4 and block out maybe this bishop. But, um, okay. There's a dynamic possibility which is shared by Houdini and Natalia here to really exploit the downsides of f3. It is a sitting target on this f file, so why not try and intensify the pressure on the f file with a dynamic pawn sack? Exactly what Natalia did now with g6. So we've got a lot of pressure bearing on f5 now. White takes on g6 here. Let's see, is, is there any other alternative? Thankfully this knight is protected by the rook, so say, say knight e4. Clearly white would welcome this reinforcing f5, but um, taking here might be possible here. Because knight c5, we have rook takes c5 here. Otherwise, this this pawn's pin it would have been helpless there. So it seems as though this this is okay um, for black against knight e4. So fg okay takes material. Now we see quite move queen e6. Just going to calmly regain the pawn. Another method could have been queen g7 on engine inspection in this position just to regain that pawn. But either method, we've still created an intensification of pressure down this f file and black's pieces are basically harmoniously and beautifully placed really if you look at this bishop and knight and this rook down the f file and white's pieces have an artificial look to them especially this rook on a2 but uh, it's made a bit more functional with b3 not only reinforcing c4 but maybe the rook can swing across potentially okay, queen g6 and now knight e4 okay in this position, Tanya plays actually bishop takes e4, giving up that that light squared bishop, but there are advantages in doing so. For a start, the knight bishop scenario in endgame looks pretty good actually. If the bishop's on the same colour as all these pawns, maybe the knight can plonk itself later on d4. Strategically, that's not a bad endgame in principle. But also in the middle game, which the gods have given us before the end game, the the F file can be used and actually Antonio plays rook f6, dual purpose, protecting d6 and double rooks, try and infiltrate down on f2 at some point. Bishop g2, add support for e4, make sure rook f2 is not going to be that dangerous. Okay, this is played anyway. And now rook d2, front of the attack. The rook's found a central position where it's actually doing a lot more than on d2. But white's kind of passive. Look at that knight eyeing b3 and the queen's tied down to b3 at the moment. And it's looking at e4 as well. This is a beautiful knight. Still, how do you win this position? That's the question. King g7 is played, which maybe is a bit of a prophylaxis type move. But it's also a kind of baiting move, you know, potentially. 
at the moment this this d6 is adequately protected laterally but at some point maybe the d6 is going to be sacrificed and at some point then queen d5 is not going to be checked so then maybe the king is only going to be slightly sla safer on a light square here rook e3 and it looks as though white's counterplay has been stuffed a bit and this is a characteristic of Antonio's wins, uh, some of Antonio's wins with black, where the counterplay of play with white has been severely reduced. So we see here now a waiting move. We're approaching move 40. It's a non committal waiting move, rookie 6, still adding support, keeping the support on d6 for a moment. So maybe this is the move 40 time control. And now queen g5, actually, okay eyeing these rooks is, is pretty useful it seems and also there's the queen f4 check idea rook g3 and we see a5 because this might be exposed to an attack at some point and this also looks as though there's a pass pawn potential over here queen d1 and white's back to a position with very little counterplay a bishop on the same color of all its pawns and black's dominating it seems not only the f file but dark squares a little bit but uh, for the moment, Queen G6. Okay. Rook A2. If White's uh, looking at the A5 pawn, what about the defense of the king? What about this second row? What about F2 infiltrations? Okay, but uh, now, after Rook E F6, White does move away resources away from the king, and, and we we've seen so many games recently where as soon as the the queen goes away from the king. White, white, the king's often in trouble. But here it's a rook going away from the defense of the second rank. Here with the move rook takes a5. So there's a big question here: Is this actually necessary? Could could black just systematically increase um, the advantage in the position? Here it looks as though there's various knight maneuvers which are kind of tasty on the dark squares. In any case, so white doesn't play. Let's let's just check with an engine here. What were the alternatives? It's actually given us a move and probably a better move than anything else. So why why is that? What if, for example, let, let's imagine rook d2 again. In this position there seems to be a tactical move. Knight takes e4. Oh sorry, not so tactical. That's a loose pawn. And the exchange of pawns here after takes takes rook takes d6 I think would be terrible for the white king safety white will be getting mated here just this is an example of the dangers so white is really got to be careful about the pawns here so let's let's go back here and imagine rook e2 the passive rook e2 now here rook f2 so white is really under pressure now say rooks did come off like this engine line suggests queen g5 the dark squares have been looked at and without much defense white can only try and hold everything together so black's doing very well but um okay it's not incredibly clear what black's winning plan might be rook f2 a general intensification of pressure but um, you know white can cause some problems it looks a bit scary to allow g5 in this engine line but uh, okay in the game we see this committal rook takes a5 so as resources have been taken away from the king it is getting material black starts the, pr the, the test is put on black to play accurately to exploit the king's safety opportunity which has been provided by the resources being taken away from the defense. So rook f2 immediately threatens things like knight e4. The bishop's now pinned. But we also see an access route to black's king with check. The king keeps being on the dark square that wants to avoid queen d5. King g1. And now queen g5. Offering another distraction of another resource the queen this time to take on d6 it's getting a bit scary 
isn't it? Because Queen D6 is also not only more material, but another piece which can potentially head towards Black's king. Okay. Queen D6 it is. So now a tactical move played Montalia in this position, which is very strong. I wonder if you can guess it if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay. Black's two pawns down here and has invited these resources over and there's a lot of bait here to be had as well as winning pawns but knight takes e4 at least gets one of the pawns back and okay it can't be taken here if um, if bishop takes e4 then a weakness of the last move like the f1 square there's no um, and not only that the, the rooks are stopping the king from stepping to h2 here because the bishop on g2 was enabling king h2 but here queen queen c1 looks to be end of white's king it's mating so that's it can't be taken white actually took on f8 believe it or not in this position by the way as well as knight takes e4 it might also be the case that queen c1 check is also very powerful still being two pulled down and in this position queen f4 creates real issues like rook takes g2 check so this is another way of playing the position but both may be equally effective knight takes e4 prompted here queen takes f8 so it is actually forking uh, queen and rook though so what does white actually do here in this position can the queen move back you might think well actually here check queen f4 again very powerful move and there there looks to be a very strong threat now of actually rook takes g2 forget knight g3 rook takes g2 let's just make sure of that let's give white a move to make sure rook g2 is actually the major threat let's say white plays rook b7 rook takes g2 mate in 7 queen f2 knight takes g it's, it's vicious so that's the major threat here and if white wants to uh, give up the rook then that's that's pretty hopeless this here queen takes g3 it's hopeless here queen takes e4 we have rook f1 mate that pinned rook that pinned bishop rather is not helping king safety so okay so we'll go back so this is why knight takes e4 now is really bad news for white so white plays this uh, queen set queen takes f8 check and we see two pieces being collected here bishop takes e4 but in this position the queen's very dangerous on the dark squares queen f4 double attack but you might think hang on hang on there's a problem with this white can save the bishop here with rook f3 and if as she takes that would be mates that would be quite embarrassing but no Tony has seen this check 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 in that position by the way if the king dared to step on the dark square then taking and then queen d4 unfortunately wins the rook the rook is unfortunately placed on a7 right now and this forms um, an important part of the game conclusion check check now rook takes f3 and we see that idea that queen f2 will pick up the rook white tries to save the rook with check and now to still maintain two pieces uh, for the queen and we've got this running c pawn so is this going to be really dangerous for white protection? is it going to be so clear cut rather uh, if the queen hasn't got any support but no there's a key move here a neat little move that Natalia plays if I give you 10 seconds can you spot it in this position 
10 seconds starting from now. Okay. Rook f8. Decoying the rook. Drag and drop for the rook. Drag and drop tactic. So the rook takes with f8, but now, unless after king g7, the king is now hitting the rook, and the bishop's still attacked, and they can't coordinate to help each other. And here, might resign. So a kind of sparkling dynamic game in the arcane jewel variation. Let's have a look in overview and summary. So an accelerated Queen's Bishop Fianchetto, not worried about things like Knight G5. Rook E1 and the characteristic Bishop C5 pointing at White's King quite aggressively. But the downside is this C3 and D4 with tempo. That's played out. Okay, and here we see the, see the value of the, the Fianchetto Bishop behind the scenes. If White's greedy, E4 is going to drop. Bishop E3 setting a little trap which uh, it's not possible to play knight e4 because of d5 so d6 and now we see h6 okay one of the downside of the bishop being over here is that the pin could be more painful so the pin is ruled out the use of g5 is ruled out here which frees also the rook without having to worry about knight g5's bishop still pointing at f7 white returns the complement with h3 approving h6 Rook e8, now d5 closing the center, doubling black's pawns, but um, the intention paradox is right now to undouble pawns to try and seek uh, more exploitable weaknesses on the queen side. But uh, while that process is happening, black is preparing now a strike against the center again with f5. So the rook actually goes back now. The signal given with that g3 that uh, there's really a lot more to gain now from this f file than before. So bishop d3, attacking at h3, protecting h3, preparing again f5. Knight a4, sort of drag and drop of the rook on a2, which is convenient if f5 is going to be played. You want to take d5 with tempo, which is the case now. So it's taken with tempo, attacking the rook. Now nifty knight c5. Bishop b7. Okay. In this position. You might think, by the way, uh, what about could b4 have been played in this position? Uh, we didn't make really a note of that in the game g4 was played but imagine b4 yes queen takes f5 dynamic aggression of this bishop is being demonstrated on this diagonal for example <laughs> so so white has to be careful about this f file right now so g4 unfortunately but it can be exploited with this uh, soon with this pawn sacrifice with this g6 pawn sack but first b4 is ruled out here and then we get the pawn sack and the celebration of this f file pressure and not only that look at how many pawns are going onto light squares in this position with the with the bad bishop and so black is keen to um get this knight bishop scenario build up some f file pressure and this kind of decoying stage where the pieces look nice but to make inroads, it's nice to uh, distract some defensive resources away from the king here. So it seems that um, the queen side a a5 pawn is the first one to be offered as bait soon, because the rook is going after that. So it's offered as bait to try and make inroads on the, on the second rank, and now more bait is offered with queen g5, this d6 pawn. But there's this beautiful concept here that d6 is a bit of a poison pawn here, as we as we saw. Queen d6 and then knight takes e4. It looks a dangerous position anyway in this position. Um, let's just very quickly check if there was white black is standing better. Let's say rook a1. Queen c5. 
queen f4. The f file looks a real menace. Just taking, for example, the queens came off rook b2, and this knight versus bishop scenario is very strong. B3 is a bit loose here, so this this is a bit of a miserable position for White to play. If he's losing, if she's losing b3, this this is going to be a dangerous pass pawn as well. So okay, White kind of accelerated her own demise with queen takes d6. So knight takes e4, powerful move. And um, the tactics just don't work out for White to even get the two pieces against the Queen here. Uh, all these checks um, mean that actually now this a7 is loose and it's brought to f8 now, drag and drop tactic. And here White resigned. So a very, very powerful game against actually a higher rated opponent. Tatiana Gozenseva, uh, who's 25.30, and Tony's 2.448, so almost, um, well, quite a significant rating gap there. And uh, so a little bit of a scalp for Natalia on, on the on the Fido rating scale, but Natalia's rating should go up. She's the R Russian Women's Super Final Champion now. Congratulations again to her. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.